for the defense. Please support your honor. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my name is Dick Harfuglian. I think I introduced myself to you all and our the attorneys, the three other attorneys, Jim Griffin, Philip Barber, Margaret Fox. It is our honor to represent Alec Murdoch, or Murdoch, depending on how you pronounce it. I say it's our honor because I submit to you what you have heard from the Attorney General as facts are not, are not. They're his theories, his conjectures. Now stand up. This is Alec Murdoch. And Alec was the loving father of Paul and the loving husband of Maggie. You're not going to hear a single witness say that their relationship, Maggie and Alex's relationship, were anything other than loving. You're going to hear about how they went to a baseball game the weekend before. You're going to hear about their relationship. You're going to see texts and emails indicating a loving relationship. Paul, the apple of his eye. You're going to see a video somewhere between 7.30 and 8 o'clock, the night of the murders, with Paul and Alec riding around looking at some trees they planted. It's a Snapchat that Paul sent to other people because the trees were not planted very well. They were cantilevering over. They're laughing. They're having a good time. That would be about an hour before the attorney general says he swatted them. When I say he swatted them, but they were swatted, and no question, Paul Murdoch was shot twice with buckshot, 12 gauge buckshot, once in the chest. And by the way, that shot in, would indicate it was in the chest and came out under his arm, like somebody that might've been holding up their hands. So when he says no defensive wounds, he perhaps is being held at shotgun. I mean, I can make the same sort of speculation that the attorney general can, because that's all he's doing is speculating. What we do know is 12 gauge, fairly close range shot to the chest. He must have been turned because it comes out under his arm. There's wadding, if you're familiar with the shotgun, under his arm. The second shot, ended up, and there's going to be some question about the direction of that shot, but ended up entering his skull cavity, and the gases from that shot literally <coughs> exploded his head like a watermelon hit with a sledgehammer. All that was left was the front of his face. Everything else was gone. His brain exploded out of his head, hit the ceiling in the shed, and dropped to his feet. Horrendous, horrible, butchering. So to find Alec Murdoch guilty of murdering his son, you're going to have to <coughs> accept that within an hour of having a extraordinarily bonding, you can see it in the Snapchat, that he executes him in a brutal fashion. Not believable. Not believable. Now, Maggie is shot running. There's no defensive wounds because she's shot running. And after she falls to the ground and had one bullet uh, that has, has hit her uh, and probably traveled up and hit her brain, she's on the ground. And whoever the perpetrator was walked up took that AR and put one in the back of her head. Executed. Executed. Why? 
this is going to be interesting because we don't know why. He doesn't know why. He's got theories of this and theories of that. But why? Number one. Number two, what was it in that hour between when he's yucking it up with Paul? And, and let me say this to you. His record, he was interviewed. He comes home and finds, there's no question about this. They've got telemetry from his car. He, he left the house at 9.06, returns at 10.01 after seeing his mother who has dementia. Now, remember, that day, his father, who is dying, is taken to the hospital. Mom's home alone, the housekeeper. Perfectly reasonable for him to want to go see her. And later than usual, because his father's not there. He's in the hospital. He dies two days later. His father dies two days later. So the question is, if he leaves at 9.06 and he's back at 10.01, he literally, I mean, and he can account the cars and the cell phone records account for where he was between 9.06 and 10.01. Now, the cell phone records, and you're going to hear this from their own experts, are incomplete. They're incomplete. And we're to submit one of the reasons they're incomplete. And, and by the way, how do they find Maggie's phone? Maggie's phone was thrown out on the side of the road about a quarter of a mile away from, a little bit more, maybe a half a mile, from the Moselle property, thrown out on the side of the road. They found it by using Find My iPhone. And the way they did that, they had to open it or have access. Who gave them the code to open the phone? Now, Murdoch. <laughs> And it's not destroyed, it's just thrown on the side of the phone. What you're also going to see is that Alec Murdoch was calling that phone at 9.06. As he leaves the house, he, he did call her twice and texted her. And we also know that at 9.06, as he cranks his car, as the cell phone records show that, as the telemetry data from the shows the cell phone linking up with the car, that phone is being thrown on the side of the road almost a half a mile away. Now that is Houdini. That is magic. That is inexplicable. Now, I was making notes while the Attorney General was talking. But let me tell you what is more believable. The night he comes home and finds his wife and son butchered, and when I say butchered, you're going to see these photographs. When I see them now, after having seen them for the last four or five months, it still shocks me. It still is tough to look at. It still bothers me. And he comes home and finds his son laying in his own blood with his brain laying at his feet, shot to hell. He walks over, he checks to see if there's any life there, although, I mean, he's seeing his brain laying outside his body. He knows there's nothing there. He goes over and tries to get a pulse out of Maggie. No pulse there. Calls 911. I want you to hear that 911 tape. It is a man hysterical in grief, trying to, trying to figure out what's going on. And he tells the 911 operator that he concerned and he drives the up back up to the house. And by the way, you can't see, I've been out there, you can't see the shed where you might see the top of the shed. There are pine trees between the front porch or the or the or the porch on the house and the dog pens. And it's not a third of a mile. Maybe by the way the crow flies, but it takes a little bit longer to drive down there. And this is not unusual for them to communicate by cell phone or text, even when they're all on the same property. It's 1,100 acres. Big property. They hunted it. So, what I'm trying to say to you is that the, 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 the Attorney General has given you his view. And again, you can't see the shed. And I'm going to ask the judge at some point during this trial to ask you, the jury, to be able to go to the scene so you can see it. You can understand the proportions. You can understand the details. Because the facts are what matter here. The facts. Let me give you another fact. You're going to hear their witnesses explain the catastrophic injuries to Paul. 
that his head literally exploded. And whoever shot him with that shotgun was probably no more than three feet away. Maybe, maybe closer, maybe a little further away. You, his head exploded. You would be covered in blood from head to foot. Head to foot. In blood. They seized his clothes that night. Sweat did. And they test, well, first of all, you're going to see in the videos from the agent, the officers that arrived that night, there's no blood on him. They didn't find any blood on him. Sweat's testing indicated 12 different places on his shirt and pants, no human blood detected, period. Okay? You'll see pictures, a white t-shirt, no blood on it. Those are facts. Those aren't theories. Those are facts. Another fact that is, I think, the reason we're here today. When you hear those questions on the videotapes on the night, now he's found his wife and son brutally butchered. You can hear on the 911 tape, he is hysterical. He go, comes in and out. It's consistent if any of you have ever, you, you gotta use your human, your experience as part of this deliberation process. Your human experience, if you've ever suffered a catastrophic loss of a friend or a family member, it's numbing. It's, it, it's the minute you find out, or if you see them dead, it's numbing. You go into shock. So anything he said that night is, is in the context of just an hour or two before finding his wife and son butchered. He drove back up to the house while he was on 911 saying, I got to get a gun. Whoever did this might be out there. And he gets a gun. What's fascinating about, about that is he gets a, a 12 gauge shotgun and he grabs some shells. They, these people hunt a lot. They have guns everywhere. He grabs some shells. He puts a 16 gauge, uh, I mean, a, t a 12 gauge, grabs a 12 gauge shotgun, put a 12 gauge buckshot in, and then he put a 16 gauge buckshot in. That's how shook up he was. Guy hunted all his life, and he put a shell in that wouldn't, he couldn't fire a 16 gauge from a 12 gauge. <laughs> Makes no sense. He was traumatized. GSR, their own expert at SWED said the amount of particles of GRSR are consistent, consistent with that him going up and picking that shotgun up. They want to talk about GSR? Again, if you fired a shotgun twice and a rifle uh, six times, you'd be covered in GSR. Those are the facts. That's not his theory. The facts. Now let's talk a little bit about these ARs. Again, you're going to hear testimony. A lot of guns. They had a gun room. You know, I don't live in Calvin County. I live in downtown Columbia. Ain't no gun rooms in downtown Columbia. But apparently if you live on 1,100 acres and you hunt deer and you hunt whatever they were planting those sunflowers for. Uh, quail, I guess. A big uh, you have a lot of guns. The truth is, in 2017, and you'll hear the testimony, that Alec bought two blackouts, one for Paul and one for Buster, the, his other son, who's sitting out in the audience. And Paul had one, his stolen. He bought another one for Paul. Now, Paul was very irresponsible with guns, cars. He'd leave guns around, he'd leave guns in cars. He oftentimes left guns down at the, uh, at the dog pens in the feed room. Now, I can't tell you whether he was shot with his own weapon or not, or his mom was shot with his weapon or not. But I can tell you that they weren't shot by Alex. They don't have the guns. There's no way to tell conclusively without having the weapons what weapons those were fired by. And we'll be talking a little bit with the sweat experts about that. The, 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 the sort of overarching issue here is why murder on June 7th, 2021, why is it September of 2022 before they charge him? And I will tell you what happened that night. And this is a problem. 
He's being, he's questioned, and the questioning is pretty aggressive. You'll hear it. They're, he's traumatized. They suspect him. He, they show up, he's got a shotgun. They suspect him. And the next morning, two people found butchered and here in Colleton County, Moselle Road. The police announced, don't worry. There's no danger to y'all. There's nobody out there that could pose a danger to you. Because you see, they decided that night he did it. Without forensics, without cell phones, without any of that. And they've been pounding that square peg in the round hole for the last, well, since you know, since uh, June of 2021, resulting in charges in September of 22. And so if he felt, and he did, and you'll hear it, the accusatory fashion he's being interviewed in, he may not have dealt all the facts. But, but by the way, whether he'd been down to the dog pens that night or not, really didn't matter really doesn't matter because you're going to see cell phone activity that would be, let me put it to you this way. Paul's phone, 850. Maggie's phone later than that, 854. Clearly is still being used. At 906, he's up at the house, getting in the car, cranking it up to drive over and see his mom. He says, few hundred yards away. It's a little bit further than that. But the point of the matter is he would have had to have executed both of them, got back up to the house, got the bloody clothes off. And by the way, they seized his clothes from that night. They've never searched his house for any other clothes that we know. Of. Although that night he gave permission and they got a search warrant. Go to my house, go look through everything. Where are the bloody clothes? Where are the bloody clothes? And of course, I would tell you that they've woven this story together because they want everything to be consistent. What's important about that is the judge, and, and by the way, there's no eyewitness. There's no forensics tying him to the murder. When I say forensics, fingerprints, blood, whatever, tying him to shooting anybody that night. The cell phone records would indicate he would have had less than 10 minutes to kill him get up to the house, get in the car and crank it up. He'd be covered in blood. Now, if they think he was beginning to establish an alibi, there's no evidence of that. The evidence is consistent with him seeing them earlier at the dog pen. And by the way, that bit, that audio they have of him and Maggie, they're, they're talking about one of the dogs killing a chicken. And they were debating whether it was a guinea hen or a chicken. No animosity, very normal discussion. Paul's very happy. And we know that Paul, after that, is texting back and forth with a girl about going to the movies. Nobody's down there threatening him. Daddy's not pulling out a shotgun and killing him. For, you know, 10 minutes after that, he's texting this girl. So, big question. One shooter or two, two done guns, shotgun and an AR. And by the way, Maggie has no defensive wounds because she's running. What's she running from? And and could you shoot? Typically, she would be she had a little, a little shed right, probably 150 feet from the feed room on the other side of a wall. Perhaps she heard the shotgun blast and came around and saw somebody or two people, um, and whoever it was opened up. Was there enough time to kill Paul um, and then find the AR and then ambush Maggie? Much more likely there were two people, but again, we don't have to prove anything. Let me sort of share the framework in which you should examine this. You have agreed to follow the law. And here's the law. Here is the law. He didn't do it. He is presumed innocent. 
as you sit there right now, as you sit there right now, when you look at him, you have to believe he is innocent. He didn't do it. Now, let me tell you, that's so difficult to do. I get it. And the way, the way, maybe the best way to explain it is this. This morning or yesterday, nobody really reads newspapers anymore. But if you're reading the newspaper, looking at the Internet, and you read the police had arrested somebody for some heinous crime, the natural inclination of everybody, all of y'all, is to say, thank God they caught him or her. Thank God that person is in custody. <laughs> And you did something that's so natural. We all do it. You presumed the police had arrested the person that committed the crime. You presumed him or her guilty. That is the natural thing to do. And you know what? That's fine for you to do. Any other day except today. Because you took an oath to follow the law. And the law is he is innocent. He's presumed innocent. That is your presumption. Your mental framework is he didn't do it. They've got to prove it to me beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, what's even more difficult, and this isn't a contest, this isn't a game, this isn't who wins and who loses. This is about justice. You know, Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of the justices of the Supreme Court, once said, jury duty is the highest duty a citizen can perform for their country in peacetime. Because you are protecting us from them, from the state, from the government. That's the foundation of our Constitution, is that the individual has the right to be presumed innocent, has the right to a jury trial, has a right to have his peer, his or her, peer, his or her peers in sitting <clears throat> judgment of him. That's you. And the framework is you presume him innocent, and you don't cannot convict him until the state allows an ordinary person to hesitate to act in the more important decisions in their life. Now, what makes this even more complicated is there's no direct evidence. There's no eyewitness. There's no camera. There's no fingerprints. There's no forensics tying him to the crime. None. None. I say that without any fear of contradiction whatsoever. None. And what the judge is going to tell you is, to the extent the state relies on circumstantial evidence, the circumstances must be consistent with each other, and when taken together, point conclusively to the guilt of the accused beyond a reasonable doubt. If these circumstances merely portray the defendant's behavior as suspicious, the proof has failed. Now, this smoke they've created is about suspicion. I mean, if you show up at the scene, and you got the wife and well, the wife especially dead, and the guy's got a shotgun. You know, it's pretty logical for the cops to jump to a conclusion. He did it. And the problem is that as they came to that conclusion, they have pounded that square peg in the round hole, and you're going to hear about it. They've ignored some witnesses. Um, I mean, for instance, that blue tarp with the showed up with the blue tarp. That witness who said he showed up with the blue tarp was shown a blue rain jacket that he talked about. He said, that's not it. That's not what he brought here that morning. I mean, that, I talked to her. She says, no, no, no. It, it was a blue tarp. And, and what was it? I would indicate. I would tell you that the, the testimony you're going to hear is inconsistent with the attorney general's representative to you based on interviews done by people other than me. So what I'm telling you is this, that as you sit here and listen, every time there's a witness that takes that witness stand that the state's put up there, you see, you judge the credibility, whether to believe a witness or not believe a witness, whether to believe one witness against many, many against one. You're going to have to evaluate the testimony you hear from 
from this witness stand with a critical eye. Critical eye. I mean, if you've got uncontested scientific evidence, you accept it. I've got no problem with that. The cell phone records he keeps talking about, I, I would say to you, are not necessarily accurate to the extent they're reliable. I will also tell you that there's going to be a bunch of people, and I, I will <coughs> have been promised something or threatened with something that may take the witness stand and say something. But I tell you what they're not going to say. They're not going to say they saw him kill him. They're not going to say uh, that they were involved in it. They're not going to say anything uh, that would it give you a comfort level in their testimony. Now, all of you have indicated that you will follow the law. And I say this one last time. He didn't do it. He didn't kill Butcher his son and, and wife. And you need to put from your mind any suggestion that he did. You've been picked because you said you could be fair. You were picked because you said you could follow the law. You were picked because Alec Murdoch believes that you can be fair. Now, if during this process over the next however long we're here, I say something or do something, it's most certainly based on my career, I will do, that irritates you or angers you. Sometimes I'm a little rough. Don't hold that against Al, hold it against me. If I say something that offends you in some way, don't hold that against Al, hold it against me. Remember, as you sit there right now, in your mind, he didn't do it. He is innocent. He would require a verdict of not guilty from you. That's the law. That's your oath. Thank you.